Welcome everyone to our new course, Markets and Their Critics. Uh, this is a project by the Penn Initiative of the Study of Markets. We will try doing something similar every year. In this course, we will, we will dive into the multifaceted nature of markets, scrutinizing their definitions, historical underpinnings, and the media debates surrounding them. Markets, often conceptualized solely within economic frameworks, are complex social constructs that shape and are shaped by the societies in which they operate. Throughout the course, we will engage with the classical debates that have permeated the annals of economic thought. Fundamental questions such as what constitutes a market will serve as the springboard for our exploration, inviting critical analysis and reflection. We will ponder whether markets are indispensable prerequisites for societal development or if alternative models can yield comparable outcomes. Moreover, we will contemplate the evolving role of markets in shaping the trajectory of human societies, assessing both their potential and limitations. We will discuss the role of the state. Should it intervene to rectify market failures or can markets function autonomously to achieve equitable distributions of resources? Our inquiry, however, will extend far beyond economics alone. We will broaden our lens to encompass diverse perspectives, including normative assessments of justice within markets. By critically examining the ethical implications of market dynamics, we aim to foster a nuanced understanding of the moral dimensions inherent in economic exchange. Our aim is not to provide a definite answer, but rather to foster a deep understanding of the complexities inherent in these debates and underscore their significance in shaping our societal structures and our collective future. Before starting with the first lecture, I would like to introduce our core faculty team. Today's lecturer, Jesus Fernandez Villaverde, is the Howard Marks Presidential Professor of Economics at the University of Pennsylvania and serves as the director of the Penn Initiative for the Study of Markets. Ivan Luzardo is a senior fellow in the Department of Economics at Penn. Andrejes Borenchik and Jacob Hall are postdoctoral fellows at the Department of Economics. Lastly, I, Fernando Arteaga, I'm a senior fellow at Penn and proudly serve as the academic director of the Penn Initiative for the Study of Markets. We will also have several invited guests that will also contribute in the Thursday sessions. I will introduce each of them when the time arrives. The format of the lectures is straightforward. It will consist of a lecture of 70 to 60 to 75 minutes presentations, followed by a 15 minute question and answer session. However, you can post your questions anytime during the lecture in the Zoom platform. The course materials will be posted in the course main webpage, so you can consult them anytime. The edited version of this lecture will be uploaded to YouTube as well. Without much more ado, I leave you with Professor Jesus Fernandez Villaverde and the first lecture. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Fernando, for the kind introduction. And yes, in fact, uh, let's get directly into uh, our material. And the way I'm going to do it is by sharing my screen and showing you my slides. Um, do everyone see them? Yes. Very good. Uh, these slides are also online, so it will be very easy for you if you are interested on, on them and to continue uh, you know, uh, exploring some of the ideas that we, uh, we outline. So the goal of this uh, introductory lecture is to think about markets and try to motivate why we are going to spend eight weeks together going over some of these ideas and also to explain a little bit how we envision the main structure of the course and what the goals that we have for our um, schedule. So let me start just by talking about markets as an object of study. And the way I like to conceptualize this idea is that before the mid 19th century, disputes within humans since you know the dawn of time had been a combination of struggles about three things. So for the longest time, we fought about resources. So for instance, when we were still land uh, hunter gatherers, we struggled on the land for hunting because that will give us the sustenance that we need to survive. Later, when we transition to agriculture, we started fighting about land because land will allow us to grow more cereal, usually uh, either wheat or rice, and that will allow our communities to grow. 
We also fight a lot about mineral resources, you know, who controls gold, who controls silver, who controls steam, which was very important for manufacturing weapons in the Bronze Age, and more recently, who controls coal or controls oil. We also had a lot of fights about ideology. We had religious disputes, you know, who, uh, whose religion should be the one that will rule in, in a particular area. We had fights about imperial views, who should be the boss in some particular region. <laughs> Think about, for instance, the excuse me, the Persian wars between the Persian Empire and the Greek cities that are such an important part of the classical tradition. There were four uh, struggles from ethnic conflicts. You know, one tribe to the left, one tribe to the to the right, and they don't like each other. And there were even struggles that were just purely about power. I don't know how many of you are very familiar with the famous War of the Roses of the 15th century England, but there were two houses, the House of York and the House of Lancaster. And it's not that any of them had any particular different view about how to rule England, except who should be the king, one cousin or the other cousin. And yet those were extremely bloody and cruel civil wars. However, circa 1870 or so, disputes change. And most of the disputes that we had during the 20th century were about how do we organize our economies? And this is really a very different thing. We are not fighting anymore mainly about religion or about power. We had world wars about should we have a market economy or should we have socialism? Should we have a market economy or should we have some type of fascist regime? And the way I like to illustrate this is with this photograph. Some of you may recognize this chap over here is Richard Nixon. And over here, you have Nikita Khrushchev. This is a very famous um, a scene that happened in Moscow in 1959. It's called the Kitchen Debate. There was an exhibition of different countries in Moscow and the US had a pavilion. And in that pavilion, they built or they replicate an average American middle-class kitchen, basically to convince the Russians that the US prosperity was so much higher and that this was a kitchen that everyone in the United States could afford. Of course, Nikita Khrushchev, who was the general secretary at the time of the Soviet Union, oh, I forgot to mention Nixon was the vice president at the time uh, with Eisenhower and had gone to Moscow to inaugurate the exhibition, had this debate about which of the two systems could actually provide more kitchens. And I think this is very poignant. You know, we are not fighting, Khrushchev and Nixon are not fighting about God, are not fighting about power, they are fighting about who can provide better kitchens. And in some sense, this is the situation that we still have today. After a period of market optimism, following the collapse of the Soviet Union, the financial crisis of 2007 has reopened the fundamental questions about how we organize our economies. And even in this time of so-called culture wars, most elections are decided by economic issues. If the inflation is high and unemployment is high, it's very difficult for a government to get reelected. The other way around, when inflation is low and unemployment is low, most governments get reelected regardless of their views on the culture wars. That means that thinking about markets, their strengths and their weaknesses is still absolutely vital. As Fernando was saying in the introduction, this task is surprisingly hard because markets are not just about economics. Markets are also about history. How have they developed over time? They are also about philosophy. Are the outcomes from markets fair? How do you even define fairness within the context of a market? You will see that in this course, we are going to talk about many of the great thinkers of the last few hundred years. And maybe one that will appear many times is John Maynard Keynes. Regardless of your views on Keynesian economics, I would like you to pay attention to a paragraph that he wrote in a book in 1933, where he collected some obituaries and short essays he had written on the lives of some of his most prominent contemporaries. And this is a wonderful book that I encourage everyone to read because he was a very keen observer 
of the elite in Britain at his time. The book is called Essays in Biography. And this Essays in Biography, Keynes points out this wonderful line. The master economist, and of course, I'm not going to claim that any of us in this course is a master economist, but at least we aspire to be as good as we can, must possess a rare combination of gifts. He must be a mathematician, think about this as the theory that we use in economics, but it must also be a historian, so to understand history, a statesman to understand how politics develops, a philosopher to be able to judge outcomes in some degree. You can read the rest of the quote. The quote. The point is that if we really want to have a nuanced and subtle understanding of markets, of, his, of their strengths and uh, weaknesses, we really, really need to bring to the table a lot of different fields of study. Of course, in eight weeks, we can only scratch the surface. There are going to be a lot of things that we are not going to be able uh, to talk about. If we had enough time and resources, this, could, this course could easily take a whole year, a whole academic year. And even then, we will probably have to leave a lot of, of stuff on the table. But we hope that at least we can provide you with some brief introduction, with a brief introduction to some of these ideas that you can later take on on your own. Now, some of you may have already noticed that the title of this course is Markets and Their Critics and not Capitalism and Its Critics. And you maybe wonder why we focus on markets and not on perhaps a more common word, which is capitalism. The reason is very straightforward. Capitalism is a polysemic term. By polysemic, mean, I mean a term that has many different meanings. If I go and I randomly get 10 faculty members from the economics department, from the political science department, or from the philosophy department, and a top research university in the US, and I ask them to write down a definition of capitalism, I'm happy to take a bet that you will get 10 different definitions, some of which will be extremely difficult from the others. Moreover, it is a concept that is very difficult to use neutrally. In fact, it was popularized, if not created, by Pierre-Joseph Proudhon and Louis Blanc. You have over here this guy to your left is Proudhon, and this guy to your right is Blanc. And both of them used the term to criticize the economic system of France and Western Europe at their time in the first half of the 19th century. So by construction, the word capitalism already implies a very particular view about social relations and economic systems, while, in my opinion, market is a much more neutral way, a much more neutral term. As a much more neutral term, it's easier to engage into a serious discussion about it. Furthermore, the use of the word capitalism leads us to what I think are a lot of blind alleys in terms of argumentation. There is an immense literature on what was called the origins of capitalism or more recently, or the history of capitalism. Why was this? Well, because once you have a definition of what an economic system is, you can go back to the data and try to figure it out what that economic system or when that economic system started. But the problem is, if you have 10 different definitions, you will have 10 different start points. And since you will have 10 different start points, you will have 10 different possible mechanisms that explain why that economic system started. And at the end of the day, instead of learning something, we end up having what I think are quite sterile disputes. You could say, well, you know, professors having uh, sterile disputes is not a bad outcome after all, or maybe not that bad, but I will go one step further. I will argue that it leads to misleading policies. So let me tell you, for instance, about the idea of the primitive accumulation. And that primitive accumulation, oops, I actually skipped uh, one slide, sorry about that, um, was proposed by a very famous British historian in the 20th century called Maurice Doff. And Maurice Doff, I have a photo of him, but somehow he disappeared from the slides. I will fix the slides and put it back. Argue, uh, following Marx, that capitalism only started when there had been an enough 
original accumulation of capital to start the capital in capitalism. So that position by Maurice Dopp was very, very influential. And it led to policies during all the 20th century in which governments try to accumulate a lot of capital to jump start their own primitive accumulation in their own countries. And the most famous example was Joseph Stalin. Stalin thought that without a primitive accumulation extracted from peasants in the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union could never industrialize. And that led to the agricultural collectivization in the Soviet Union that you probably know caused perhaps as many as 10 million deaths. So these themes, these discussions about should I use the word market or should I use the word capitalism? When do capitalism, when does capitalism start have real consequences? These days in the US, you probably know there is a very renewed interest on the role of slavery. And again, I think that because we are using the incorrect mental frameworks, we are getting incorrect answers that are biasing a lot of the economic policies that we are implementing in the US and in some Latin American countries in the wrong way. So academic disputes are not just academic disputes. Ideas matter, as Hegel would have put it. And finally, a small point, which is some historians, in particular, one of my favorite, Fernand Baudel, over here you have it, a very famous French historian, have emphasized that, in fact, capitalism is a system of the anti-market. He argued over here in this book, The Civilization and Capitalism in the 15th to the 18th centuries, three volumes, so I'm only putting the first volume over there, because, in his view, capitalists, try to move away from the market and try to achieve positions of monopoly, which will not be what we have in mind as a market economy. Not that I fully agree with Brodel on that point, but one important goal during this course is always to be open to many different interpretations. Furthermore, one can have markets in situations where there is no private ownership. In fact, during the 20th century, a very important discussion was the proposal for market socialism, which was first put on the table by Oscar Lange, this chap over here, a very famous Polish economist, who basically argued, I like markets. Markets do good jobs in terms of allocating resources. I don't like the property private property, because private property leads to bad, or bad distributions of what we are able to produce with markets. So can we think about a system that gets the best of both worlds? And he called that market capitalism. Sorry, market socialism. More recently, John Roemer, who is a professor at Yale University, wrote a book, A Future for Socialism, that revived that idea. If any of you cares, I read that book when I was an undergrad, and I thought it was intriguing. Not that I agree with it, but at least because it made what I thought was a very compelling and careful argument for that alternative economic system. In practice, we have never really seen a socialist market economies, economy. Perhaps the closest that we ever had was Yugoslavia during the 1970s and 1980s. The experience of Yugoslavia hints that market socialism is not going to work very well, but at the same time, you could argue that Yugoslavia was a very peculiar situation. I would argue, in fact, that there are many situations where we have something that looks a little bit like market socialism, like in allocations within firms and universities. Here at the University of Pennsylvania, for many, many years, the ways in which classes were allocated to MBA students were based on auctions and students will bid on those auctions with points that they were given at the start of their MBA. That's a market and at the same time is in some sense a socialist market because everything was centralized and the ownership of those points was directly allocated by the dean's office. Many other firms have tried to replicate these internal markets and maybe we can have time to talk about those later in the course. In fact, Markets have overlap with all types of economic systems, often in opposition to the legal system. Think about the market for drugs. Well, it is not a surprise to you that it's relatively straightforward to find 
control substances pretty much anywhere in the world, will be not very difficult for any of us here at Penn to probably find some illicit drugs in five to 10 minutes if we walk around campus looking for them. And not only there is no legal support for those transactions, but there is actually legal opposition. And the campus police will try to prevent us from doing that. And yet, as far as my understanding goes, this is not a very difficult thing to, or the purchase of these substances is not particularly difficult. Also, sometimes markets are informal. And some of you may have read some of my papers. And one of my favorite examples of informal markets and the appearance of money is the trading of soccer cards, or if you are outside the US, of football cards. So when I was a small kid, and I think this still exists, in Spain, I'm from Spain originally, it was very popular among kids to buy these cards from the local kiosk where you will have these famous uh, soccer players and they behave as money for transactions within a school. So let's suppose that today um, we go to the cafeteria for lunch and they are serving vanilla ice cream and I really love vanilla ice cream. So I will ask my friend Carlos Falcini, do you want to give me your um, uh, vanilla ice cream? And he will say, okay, but give me 20 cards. And I will give him 20 cards. And that's just a market. It's a market for ice cream at the cafeteria, which the administrators at my school have never thought about. And I'm showing you over here uh, the card of one of my, which was my very favorite uh, player at the time, Carlos Santillana, who was a forward for Real Madrid. Nonetheless, we are not going to spend a lot of time talking about these informal markets, and we are not going to spend a lot of time talking about illicit markets. We are going to think more about economies that are primarily organized around markets, like the US right now. The key word, of course, over here is primarily. We are not going to deny it that the states play a very important role in the allocations of goods and services in the United States and other advanced economies right now. And in fact, part of what we are going to do during this course is try to think about whether or not those interventions are too much or maybe too little. And we want to keep an open mind about that. Very good. But we have been talking about markets a lot, but in no moment we have defined what markets are. And I want to think about markets as a cooperative arrangement. Now, we need a working definition. I'm not going to get very philosophical or, you know, trying to come up with a definition that will cover every single case and every single nuance. I usually find that the search for the perfect definition often is not the best use of time. That instead, one can come up with what I'm going to call a working definition, which is good enough to work in the short run, and will cover most of the cases, even if there are a few situations where maybe the definition is not perfect. So I'm going to define a market and as an environment in which two or more agents freely exchange goods and services. If you read that line, you will notice three points. The first point is that we have two or more agents. Why is this important? Because the number of agents in the market is going to determine the power that each of these agents have in terms of setting down prices and allocations. Some of you probably have taken intermediate microeconomics and have learned about perfect competition as a situation where there are so many sellers and so many buyers that none of them has any market power. That's probably just uh, an abstraction that is very rarely uh, happening in real life, perhaps in some financial markets, you can get an approximate uh, situation like that. But it's a very nice abstraction because it helps us to understand what happens when there is no market power. On the other hand, you have the situation where perhaps there is a monopoly, only one seller, or a monopsony, only one buyer. And then there is a lot of power. And we will see a lot of market power that the allocations that we will get are different. And maybe that's a situation where we feel that the type of interventions that we want to have are different, or the way in which we judge market allocations is different. Or think about the cases of a bilateral monopoly, where I'm the only buyer and you are the only seller 
of a very particular good. Imagine that you have a beautiful, beautiful first edition of Hayek's The Constitution of Liberty that was signed by Hayek. And I'm the only one who wants to buy that book. And yes, just as an example. Well, it's an interesting problem because it's still a market. It's two of us. We are trying to exchange a very particular good and we are doing it freely. No one is forcing us to do it. How is the price going to be determined in that situation? Do we think the price that comes out of this is fair? Well, we will come back to all these things. This is just a moment to whet your appetite about ideas to come. The second point of the definition is the presence of an exchange of goods and services. And that's fine, you know, in the example before we are exchanging a book for some money, or maybe you go to the supermarket and you buy a bottle of milk, but what about a family? Is not a family a situation in where we exchange some goods and services? I do the bed and my spouse takes out the trash. Is that a market or is not a market? In fact, some economists like Gary Baker, the famous Gary Baker, will argue that was a market. Other economists or other philosophers are reluctant to call that a market. And that's something we can consider. Or think about friends. Is the exchange of gifts between friends a market or is not a market? Well, there are things that we need to consider. And last, and perhaps this is the most important of all, is also a situation where we are going to engage into a free exchange of goods and services, where there is not going to be coercion. And this is a part that, unfortunately, when people talk about markets, we tend to forget quite often. Okay, this chap over here, very, very famous classical historian, his name is Moses Finley. And Moses Finley wrote an article in 1976 for the Times Literary Supplement called A Peculiar Institution. And he say, in the context of universal history, free labor, wage labor is the peculiar institution. Let me give you a little bit of background to understand what was going on. In the United States, before the Civil War, there was, of course, slavery in the Southern states. And the slaveholders in the South were reluctant to use the word slavery because in their deep of their hearts, they understood that the system was deeply unethical. Very interesting observation. If you read the US Constitution, the original version, not after the amendments, in no place whatsoever, the word slavery is used. And yet there are several occasions in which there are references to slavery where the authors of the Constitution come up with euphemisms to refer to it. And one of the most common euphemisms at the time was the expression, a peculiar institution. But what Moses Finley is highlighting is that through most of history, most labor has been coerced. It has not been free. That in some sense, the fact that you are the owner of your own labor and that you can participate on a labor market in a way that you are not coerced is a rare thing. It's really a creation of the last 200, 250 years. Sometimes the level of coercion was extremely high, like in slavery. Sometimes it was a little bit milder, like you are a serf in a feudal system. And sometimes it was just you are a peon in Latin America and you're supposed to do what your boss or the big person in the town tells you to do in the village, but you have a lot of freedom in your day-to-day -day life. But there was no such a thing as a free labor market. There has been many other forms of coercion like the imperialist extraction of commodities that you had in things like the British Indian Company. And here you see some of the British Indian Company ships in the Bay of Bombay. And you can see over here the flag of the East India Company. And yes, if it reminds you of the flag of some other country, you are absolutely right, because that was the inspiration for the US flag. Well, why is this important to us? Because a lot of the criticisms that markets receive is that they are based on coercion. But I just told you that my definition does not involve coercion, it needs to be free. So I will argue that in fact, the imperial extraction of commodities was not a market. More in general, being pro-market does not mean being pro-business because businesses often are the least interested in having markets. They rather have a cozy monopoly or a cozy um, contract from the government instead of having to engage in competition. 
And that goes back to the point, if you recall, I mentioned about Fernand Rodel. Very good. After this brief introduction to markets as a concept of study and markets as a way to think about exchange, I'm going to frame markets within the context of economic history. Because as we remember, I say at the beginning of this presentation, we really want to bring here economics, history, political science, philosophy, etc. together. So when do markets appear in history? This is an interesting question, because in fact, as you will say later on, a lot of people have argued that the idea of the market is just a creation of the last 300 years. I think those thinkers, in particular Karl Polanyi, are wrong. They argue that before 300 years ago, really what we have is what historians would call a moral economy, where, more transactions, where most transactions were based on reciprocity. But we will come back to that later on. My reading of the empirical evidence in economic history is that markets probably started extremely early in human life. Lascaris and co-authors documented in 2011 that there were obsidian artifacts found in the Aegean region. This is basically modern day Greece and the east coast of Turkey outside their source locations. That means not where you are going to find obsidian on earth and dated back to layers deposited around 12,000 years ago. If you remember, the Neolithic Revolution was around 10,000, 11,000 years ago. And in fact, the adoption of agriculture in what is modern day Greece was a little bit later. So what we are seeing here is that there is late Pleistocene, early Holocene, seafaring, and long distance exchange, because the only way these obsidian artifacts could arrive to Greece was through the sea and through very, very long distance exchange, well before the emergence of agriculture and well before the presence of any type of cities. What I mean by that is that commerce and trade and markets predate agriculture, predate what we think are the most fundamental <laughs> activities of humans. In fact, some paleontologists go as far as arguing that there are indications of exchange between different human groups as far back as 300,000 years ago. Adam Smith will have not been surprised. In a famous passage in the Wealth of Nations in 1776, he argued that the propensity to track, barter, and exchange one thing for another is common to all men, regardless of their location in time or space. And Adam Smith made a very simple point. The advantages of exchange, the possibility that exchange opens for division of labor, for me taking advantage that you are better than me at doing something, or that you have better endowments that I do. In the case of obsidian, you have obsidian and I don't. Or just the advantages of specialization are so gigantic, are so incredibly large, that it's nearly impossible to conceive that there has ever been two humans more or less living together that will have not start exchanging. It's just nothing that is going to happen. But Adam Smith may have got something wrong because he says it's common to all men and to be found in no other race of animals. That's where he may have been wrong. Why? A few years ago, there was this very interesting paper published by Keith Chen and his co-authors in the Journal of Political Economy. And what they document is that there is actually very clear evidence of trading behavior among capuchin monkeys. So not only humans involved in exchange, apes, or in this case, um, comets, uh, like capuchin monkeys are going to engage into trade. And I suspect that if we look carefully through the animal kingdom, we are going to find that other species with relatively large brains also engage into this trading in very interesting ways. Read the paper, it's fascinating because this is just not an exchange, trivial exchanges. Some of the exchanges actually get really, really sophisticated. So this is not just, you know, I leave one nut for you and you give me another nut. No, no, this, you will see it involves also sexual behavior and things like that. It's really, truly fascinating. So markets, I really think that markets are everywhere, even among capuchin monkeys. In fact, 
um, a lot of things that we don't call markets are really markets. Let me point out to the father of ethnology in France and of a lot of modern anthropology, Marcel Mauss. And if you want to read more about his quite fascinating life, I will point out this biography by Marcel Fournier. Mauss wrote a book that I think everyone should read called The Gift. And Mauss argue that there are few cases, well, in fact, he will go as far as saying that there are none, cases of gifts that are not really open exchanges. That in ancient tribes, you will quote unquote pretend you given a gift to another tribe, but that was really because you were expecting that the tribe will recipro reciprocate in the future. And he just called, this is the way you organize exchange in the absence of money. In fact, economists have proved carefully and in a formal way, this equivalence between what we call a gift economy and an economy with money. And basically argue that gift economies appear when there is no money. And later as money evolves, then we start having less and less of these gifts. And that goes back, for instance, at some of the exchanges I was referring between perhaps families or even perhaps within friends. And certainly there are some things that friends do for each other that will be a little bit cringy to call them markets, will be a little bit cringy to use money, but at the end of the day, you actually get the same allocation through the presence of the gift. Think about, for instance, wedding presents. I always thought about wedding presents of a way to do intertemporal trade among friends, where friends give each other gifts at a very important moment in life. And in fact, over the last 20 years or so, a lot of the wedding gifts have gone directly to being just about money and not about anything else. Now, of course, in this introductory lecture, I do not have enough time to review all the historical examples of markets and really convince you beyond any reasonable doubt that markets are everywhere in economic history. I teach an undergraduate course on global economic history at Penn. All my slides are online on my teaching page and I have 26 full lectures. And even then I need to be extremely selective and every year I run out of time. So instead of trying to accomplish the impossible, which is to go over all these different examples of markets, I will talk about three examples of societies where markets have played a large role. I'm going to pick three societies where perhaps you have never thought that markets were so important. I'm going to talk about ancient Rome. I'm going to talk about the European Middle Ages, and I'm going to talk about Song China. Ancient Rome developed an incredibly sophisticated market economy. If you want to read more about this, I will refer you to a very nice book that Peter Temin, the famous economic historian for many years at MIT wrote a few years ago, The Roman Market Economy. And if you really, really want to get deep, the Cambridge Economic History of the Greek or Roman Wall by, uh, edited by Walter Scheidel, Ian Morris, and Richard Seller is absolutely fantastic. Rome had very high income per capita, as far as we can tell. It had a widespread international trade and had a very vibrant urban life. Yes, let me give you an example of what I mean by incredible amounts of income and international trade. If you go a little bit outside Rome, you are going to find this hill or mount. It's called Monte Testaccio. Mm. You don't pay much attention. You just look like any other hill. You know, the area Lazio, the area around Rome is pretty hilly, so you will not think much about it. But no, don't do that. Get a little bit closer. And when you get a little bit closer, you will notice that the hill is not made out of soil and rock, but of this. Which are these? These are fragments of amphorae, of clay containers. Millions and millions and millions of fragments. And what were these amphorae? Where they were the vessels used to bring olive oil to Rome from all across the empire. As you probably know in the Mediterranean diet, and even more in Roman times that today, olive oil was absolutely fundamental. You for instance, get yourself a piece of bread, some olive oil, and a little bit of vegetables, and you have a very nice, healthy, and rather balanced diet. Well, after a while, this amphorae got broken, or they were difficult to use because they were dirty, and they will just break them down and accumulate on a garbage stump. And this is just a gigantic garbage stump 
But the amazing thing is think about how many millions and millions of trades are involved into breaking all this, into having all these transactions of olive oil and finally breaking the amphora after many, many repeated uses. There was a vibrant urban life. You go through Europe and it's still very easy to see from Sirencester in England to Segovia in Spain or Naples in Italy, the remains of that urban life. And it appeared, it witnessed the appearance of Roman law, which I will discuss just in one second. Yet the economy of ancient Rome relied on slave labor. So a very important part of Rome was about slave labor. So it was not a pure market economy. It had also a very important component of slavery. And the political system became progressively more centralized and authoritarian. And in fact, I my own reading of the evidence is that precisely because this increase in centralization and authoritarian strikes, the Roman economy lost a lot of its previous vitality and that led to a weakening of the empire, which with many other mechanisms led to the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. Examples of very well-developed industries within Rome, you had industrial fishing at a gigantic level. So Roman's life garum, which is a fish oil, mm, people who have tried to replicate the ancient um, recipe uh, claim is pretty disgusting, but I guess like all the taste, it depends on what you learn as a kid. And since they love this fish oil, you had to fish a lot. There was probably a whaling industry. There was a big production of iron and brass. And you can tell that in the ice deposits in Greenland, where you see big spikes in pollution created by the Romans from burning charcoal for this iron and brass production. There was a very active market for education. Every good patrician family in Rome felt that their kids had to learn Greek and had to be knowledgeable of the Greek tradition. So they will bring Greek tutors to Rome to teach their kids. That was a market. And later, when the kid was sufficiently old, you will send the kid for a couple of years or even more to Athens or some other place in uh, Greece in not a very different way in which now European or Chinese parents send their kids to Philadelphia, to Penn, or Boston, to Harvard or MIT, or New York to Columbia to finish their education. And the places where that education, that higher graduate education was offered were privately run and operated as markets. You will show up in the academy in, in Athens, which is still run at the time, and you will pay your tuition and you will get an education. There was also a very well-developed entertaining industry. You know, we think about gladiators as this very bloody affair. And in fact, it was very bloody. But when you actually read a little bit more about what gladiator combat was about, it's not that different from professional sports in the US right now. Yeah, I, I give you the point, you know, at the end of the day, people will die. Although the number of deaths was much lower than we uh, come to believe because of the movies. But really, the entertainment industry in Rome was not very different from the entertainment industry in the United States today. And I very briefly mentioned Roman law. And the reason I want to uh, mention um, Roman law is because one of the points on this course is going to be emphasized that markets are always embedded within a set of social institutions. And no social institution is more important in that aspect than law. I will argue that Roman law is one of humanity's most amazing intellectual accomplishments. If you want to read more about it, the standard textbook is the famous Borkowski textbook on Roman law, now in the sixth edition. I always keep a copy around my house. I still love Roman law. It was one of my first loves in academic life. And it's the, perhaps the best proof of sophistication of the Roman economic life. Now, for those who do not have a legal education, when one says law, the first thing that comes to mind is criminal law. You know, Peter Smith is accused by the district attorney of having killed someone. And a very brave defense attorney saves Peter from prison. But within the big edifice of law, criminal law is actually a very minor point. And I will argue actually rather secondary. The main fundamental aspect of law is what we call private law. How we define property, how we define ownership, how do we organize contracts, how we transmit property, 
How do contracts interact with property? And Romans develop an incredibly sophisticated private law, and that was only possible because they had a sophisticated economic life, and conversely, they were able to have a sophisticated economic life because they developed private law. This is a point made by many great thinkers, including Bruno Leoni. For instance, the Romans were the first to distinguish between ownership and possession. I may or may not be the owner of this shirt that you are seeing me wearing right now, but in possession of this shirt. And it turns out to be the case that the distinction between these two different concepts, ownership and possession, is absolutely fundamental in any legal system. And it was the Romans who first came up with it. And surprisingly enough, that distinction didn't exist in many other legal systems. That's why the modern Western legal systems, both the civil legal system that exists in Western Europe and in the US in Louisiana and in Latin America, as the common law, which is the system from England and most of the United States, come directly from Roman law. Very, very directly in the case of the civil law, a little bit more indirectly in the case of the common law. All of you live common Roman law. All of you today engage in contracts. You probably live in an apartment. Well, you have a rental agreement with your landlord. Or maybe you own a house, and then you have a mortgage contract with a bank. And all those contracts, when you stripe them to the core, they are Roman law contracts. contracts. And through indirect transmission, this is also the case in other legal systems. The Civil Code of Japan is really a small modification of a draft of the BGB, which is the Civil Code of Germany, which is in itself nothing more than a clean up and simplified version of traditional Roman law. So there are two Japanese right now making transactions in Tokyo. Probably none of them knows anything whatsoever about Rome. None of them knows anything whatsoever about Roman law. But the contract they are doing right now is Roman law. If you want to read more about this, Tamar Erzog, A Short History of the European Law, develops these ideas in much more detail. Well, so Rome was really about um, markets, but that's not only the case. We also have market economy in the Middle Ages. You know, the Middle Ages was not just about castles and knights and the Crusades. Markets were also a fundamental part of the Middle Ages. Most market exchanges ended with the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. But there was a commercial revolution after 1000. If you want to read more about this collapse and how later society started to rebuild, the absolute masterpiece is by Chris Wickham fra framing the early Middle Ages. I want, however, to... Um, point out this is like 1200 pages book. It's not an easy read, but it's certainly a book of an impressive level of scholarship. The commercial revolution meant that little by little economic life started to be organized again around markets, like the famous Champagne Fairs. And if you want to read a little bit about this, this book is a little bit old. Uh, in some places it's dated, but it's a very simple introduction to many of these ideas. Robert Lopez, The Commercial Revolution of the Middle Ages, 1950-1350. And that led to that development of economic life around markets in Middle Ages Europe led to a lot of fundamental developments. For instance, Lex Mercatoria, which just means the law of the merchants, was developed. And it was developed by the interaction, the freely interaction of merchants who wanted to come up with a legal system of their own. There are few examples, clearer, a few clearer examples of what is an spontaneous order in the words of F.A. Hayek that the Lex Mercatoria in the Middle Ages. And by the way, all the commercial law that we have today is really Lex Mercatoria with a few details. Roman law is rediscovered. And again, the really interesting thing is that people all across Europe adopted Roman law not because the kings wanted the Roman law. In fact, the kings usually didn't like Roman law. People wanted to be ruled by Roman law because it was such a better legal system. It led to the revival of cities. It led to the creation of universities. This very same university, the University of Pennsylvania, that is offering you this course is a direct descendant of the University of Bologna, 
that appeared thanks to the revival of economic life in the Middle Ages Europe, and it led to the Renaissance. If you want to read about this, I will strongly encourage you to take a look at Richard Goldthwait, the, economic, the Economy of Renaissance Florence. First, we think about Florence, you know, Brunelleschi, and the birth of Venus, and Santa Maria, and all the great creations of Florence Renaissance. But what people forget is that Florence was the most industrialized city of its time, probably in the whole world. And that, that was that industrialization based on the exchange of textiles and later of many other goods that led to the Renaissance. That without the material conditions, the Renaissance will have never happened. So the next time you are looking at the birth of Venus, think about that. This is a consequence of a market economy. There were also markets, for instance, all across the Burgundian lands and in particular in what was Flanders over here, and later on in Brabant and Holland. And that led, of course, to the Flemish Renaissance. And if we had more time, I will also explain how it led to the creation of things like the stock market. In many European languages, the stock market is some variation of bourse, like bolsa in Spanish. And that came because the stock exchange started to be organized in an inn that was owned by the Boers family. Also, we have the Hansa that traded all across North Europe from Novgorod in today's Russia all the way to London. And if you travel around many of these cities, you will see the Hansa buildings. In Bergen, in Norway in particular, they have a beautiful Hansa set of buildings owned by the Hansa. But even more, I will argue that the commercial revolution of the Middle Ages led a little bit later to the trips of discovery of Europeans, which changed in history as nothing has done since the Neolithic revolution. So let me go back to Adam Smith again and point out how in the Wealth of Nations he states, the discovery of America and that of a passage to the East Indias by the Cape of Good Hope are the two greatest and most important events recorded in the history of mankind. You certainly need to agree with him. But look at how subtle Adam Smith is. This is really amazing. The great thinkers, and in this course, we are going to try to engage with some of these great thinkers. The amazing thing about great thinkers is how subtle they are in some of their statements. Their consequence, consequences have already been very great, in fact, in 1776. But in the short period of between two and three centuries, which has elapsed since these discoveries were made, it is impossible to that the whole extent of their consequences can have been seen. And I always pointed out, remember, the Wealth of Nations, 1776, same year of the Declaration of Independence. And this passage was probably written many months before that. That means that, yes, right a little bit after Smith publishes the book, you had or writes this paragraph better, you have the Declaration of Independence, you have the creation of the United States. And in some sense, you could argue that a lot of the modern world had been forged and is still being forged today within the United States. That will have never happened without the Europeans arriving to the Americas, or at least in the way it happened. And that will have never happened without the commercial revolution. But this is just not a tale about Western Europe. It's a tale everywhere. We could, for instance, talk about the markets in Aztec, uh, in the Aztec Empire before the arrival of the Europeans. And if you go back to the course we taught last year on Latin America economic history, Fernando Arteaga did a great job covering that material. So here I'm going to talk about something that I was always very interested, which is the Song Dynasty and the market economy of the Song Dynasty. The Song Dynasty was one of, was a moment of economic flourishing in China. If you want to learn more about the song in general, Dieter Kuhn has a very nice and short introduction. It's called the Age of Confucian Rule because it's perhaps the moment where the emperors follow the Confucian ideals to its corest. And there's this very nice book by William Liu, The Chinese Market Economy, which it already says it all. In fact, I think that one of the most important questions in global economic history is to try to understand why China didn't take off during the song and the Industrial Revolution didn't happen there, and not in England around 600 years later. 
There was a fantastic expansion of rice cultivation. There were cash crops. Normal people started to consume tea, started to consume sugar, started to consume indigo, started to consume silk products, which were produced by mulberry, mulberries, and all those were cash crops. And associated with them, you have vibrant urban markets and a small industry. One of the most fantastic pieces of Chinese art is the Qingmin Festival. It's a very beautiful role. Check it out on the internet and it's fascinating. You can spend days looking at it. And this is just a shot from the Qingmin Festival role. And you can see over here, the markets, the markets in China, you know, like a lot of products and people is changing and chatting. And you see the happiness in their faces, probably a product of this big level of economic activity that I was mentioning before. There were also very large business firms and a lot of what a lot of these large business firms did was the creation of delicate ceramics because those was a there was a very, very large market. This is one of the ceramics from the song. Yes, if anyone cares, I'm actually really very interested in Chinese ceramic history. So I have read a fair amount of about it. But in this particular case, what you really want to think is not about the beauty and delicacy of this um, vessel. This was to put flowers, to put plant flowers on it. But the fact that those were producing millions and millions of these things to be sold all across Asia and later on Europe. There was even the first paper money. And the interesting thing also about the paper money was that it was developed by merchants to find better payment systems. And it was only later on taken by the government. And by the way, when it was taken by the government, that lead to hyperinflation. There may be a lesson over there about the advantages of private monies over public monies, but we can talk about that some other day. Anyway, what I have tried to do uh, during this brief survey of markets is to just give you a feeling that wherever you see economic prosperity, whenever you see a flourishing of life, you see a lot of markets. And that seems intriguing. That seems something that may want to think more carefully about. So let me get into an outline of the course so you have an idea where we are going to spend the next eight weeks. So after today and this brief introduction, I want to talk a little bit about our markets model. Well, this is important. And it's important in many different ways because you know, are, do markets make us better or worse persons? Or they are indifferent. Markets is, you know, like this pen I'm holding now and it's red. There is any moral implication that the, uh, red, the, pen, the, the pen is red and not blue? No, probably not. But that will, of course, will force us to think a little bit more about a concept of morality. And that will be more subtle than it seems. We will also talk about are markets stable? You know, one of the main criticisms for markets over history is that markets lead to continuous crises, and perhaps one of those crises may cause is final collapse. And we can look at the history and think about, you know, how much of truth there is in this statement. Are markets outcomes fair? You know, the fact that Elon Musk has billions and billions of dollars, and, you know, the person who comes and helps me to clean out my garden does not, is that fair? In any sense, well, again, we will need to think about concepts like how do you define fairness? What are the alternatives? And that's where a lot of these issues involving philosophy will bring. And that's why I think Keynes, remember the quote at the beginning, was so right. You cannot really be a very good economist if you don't have at least some basic knowledge of philosophy. Are markets efficient? Do markets deliver good allocations of goods and services? Or in the very narrow sense in which economies use the word efficiency, do markets get the most possible goods and services given the resources that we have around? Then we will spend some time thinking about alternative to markets. Well, during the 20th century, we had a big alternative, which was socialism, central plan economies. They didn't work very well. I think that everyone agrees on that. But they didn't work very well because they can never work very well or they didn't work very well because we didn't do it right. That next time it's going to work. Well, that's something we want to think about. Remember, I already mentioned before the idea of market socialism. Perhaps if we implement market socialism, they will work well. Or perhaps now that we have artificial intelligence, socialism can work. That's a comment that I get a lot of times 
from students. And I have written a little bit about it just to make a brief, a, a long story short. My answer is no. I don't think that artificial intelligence will allow us to have markets, eh, sorry, to have socialism. And then we can talk about the role of the state. And, you know, if markets are not perfect, should the state step in? And again, this involves a lot of issues that are a little bit more subtle that you will think uh, uh, about because the fact that something is not very good doesn't imply there is a better alternative. The way I always put it is I'm probably the best Spanish speaking economist at Penn, or maybe Victor Rios is also very good. So maybe I'm the second best Spanish economist at Penn. That doesn't imply I'm a very good economist. So maybe the markets are not very good, but everything else is worse. Or maybe markets are good. I don't know. We need to think about it. And then we need to think about how states work and how states can or cannot deliver better outcomes. And in the last talk, I will, the last less, uh, lecture, I will talk a little bit about the future of markets. And in particular over there, I want to focus on what I think are the big uh, um, themes these days. I will talk a little bit about climate change. You know, one could argue that climate change is the ultimate externality. The ultimate climate is the ultimate public good. And we can think about how markets can interact with climate change. I will mention artificial intelligence, which I already uh, discussed before. And I will also talk a little bit about the current process of geopolitical fragmentation that the world is experiencing and how this may interact with the future of markets. For the first time, we are hearing in many decades, we are hearing very powerful voices defending the return to tariffs, the returns to industrial policy, etc. We're going to spend a few minutes thinking about the strengths and the weaknesses of those arguments. Hopefully this gives you a brief idea of what we are going to do. But I also want to give you a brief idea of who we are going to engage with. So these are some of the people we are going to meet. Of course, I would love to spend a whole semester talking about each one of them. But just let me tell you at least 10 seconds about each. This over here is Plato. Well, it's a classical boost. We don't really know how Plato really looked like. Why Plato, very famous British historian, Whitehead, brought once that the whole Western philosophical tradition is nothing more than a set of footnotes to Plato. He was absolutely right. If you read The Republic, something that I think everyone should do at least four times in their lives, and if not more, you will realize that pretty much all the discussions we had over here are already there. The first book of the Republic is about justice and he starts discussing what is justice. So he's going to have some ideas, for instance, about are markets moral or are markets outcomes fair. And if you keep reading the Republic, you will realize that pretty much everything that we are going to discuss is already mentioned there in some way or another. Now, you don't need to argue, agree with uh, Plato. So for instance, in a very famous book, The Open Society at Its Enemies, Karl Popper argued that Plato proposed solutions that he thought were deeply incompatible with markets and with Western liberal democracies. Or you may agree with Plato and think that maybe Karl Popper's interpretation of Plato was not very fair. But the point is, once you have read Plato, you realize everything is there and that we are going to just spend time thinking about that. Making a big jump of around 22 centuries, we jump into David Hume. And the reason I'm putting David Hume over there is because, in my opinion, he was the first writer who very coherently brought about what he called the commercial society. And how commercial society, in his optimistic view, will make us better people. He thought that as long as you are engaged in trade, you start valuing deeply doing things for other people instead of stealing things from other people. And he thought there was something inherently good for humans and for civilization as a whole in the idea of the commercial society. Was David Hume right? Is the commercial society, is the market good for you or not? The next thinker is of course Adam Smith. And I don't need to say much about him. We already mentioned the wealth of nations twice. But in addition to the wealth of nations, you all know he also brought the theory of moral sentiments, which highlights 
the idea that markets are embedded, as I mentioned before, into a whole set of social relations. And Adam Smith is not only the father of modern academic economics, economics, but also, I think, one of the most subtle social thinkers in general of history. Then we will talk about John Stuart Mill. He was perhaps the last of the so-called classical liberals. And in some sense, he was a devoted follower of Adam Smith, but someone who, especially later in life, started to have doubts about whether or not markets were such a good idea after all. And you could argue that by the time he passed away, he was probably closer to some type of mild form of socialism. Maybe not. It's hard to tell. But to me, John Stuart Mill is a good example of how the word liberal in the English-speaking world went from being meaning pro-free markets and small government in what liberal means in academic in, in US politics today, someone in favor of a relative interventionist state. The next person is Karl Marx. And I think that Karl Marx is sometimes overestimated in the sense that I personally think that his theory of history and capitalist development is not very good, but also underestimated in the sense that I think he was the first one who really appreciated the enormous power that markets have to generate social transformations. And that one cannot be 100% neutral about those social transformations. And that we want to think about how the markets liquidates traditional relations. We want to be careful. The next person is Karl Polanyi. I mentioned him briefly when I explained certain degree of unhappiness about the idea or his idea that markets are relatively modern creation. I don't think he was right on it, but he wrote an extremely influential book, The Great Transformation, that is very uh, widely read still today, especially in history departments and sociology departments and political, soci uh, political science departments. And he argued that a lot of what markets do is very quote unquote unnatural for humans being for human beings, and that abuse of markets is going to lead nearly without any other alternative to backlashes. And people like Polanyi will say that you know the world wars were a consequence of the excesses of markets in the 19th century. Is this true or not? I don't know, but at least it's an argument that is on the table. Keynes next. And Keynes is important because he completely transformed our view about, for good or for bad, about how governments should manage aggregate demand. And the time after World War II is often called the age of Keynesian economics or the Keynesian era. Keynes had a very positive view about markets in some sense. He thought that, for instance, socialism was just a silly, dumb idea, but that markets could only work as long as the level of aggregate demand in the economy was sufficiently high or not too high. That's something, by the way, that a lot of Keynesian economists tend to forget. Keynes was so much against, was as, as much against too, uh, too low aggregate demand that too, too high demand, aggregate demand. Also, he thought that too low aggregate demand was going to be more common in modern life. And he said, well, maybe markets can work very well as long as we have a, a government, a fiscal authority, and a central bank that can manage the economy. Is that possible? Is that a good idea? I don't know. Joseph Schumpeter, and in some sense, this is the closest to all of us for a very peculiar motive. And it's simply that Joseph Schumpeter, sorry, the advisor of the advisor of the advisor of the advisor of my advisor is Joseph Schumpeter. So I'm a direct academic descendant in terms of PhD from Joseph Schumpeter. And Joseph Schumpeter brought a very influential and very deep book called Capitalism, Socialism of Democracy. And I still remember reading it when I was in high school, believe it or not. Uh, and he argued that he didn't think that capitalism had a future or a market economy in the terminology of discourse. And the reason he thought that that was the case is because he thought that market economies also create a lot of educated classes and that those educated classes are going to be inherently against markets because markets is where they don't do the best. That you have your brilliant, shiny, PhD in anthropology, 
and you have spent 10 years getting your PhD in anthropology, and then turns out to be the case that some silly boy that went directly into finance is making 20 times as much as you do, and you are very unhappy. And he thought that this group of intellectuals and highly educated elites will be the demise of capitalism. And Joseph Schumpeter brought this, not happily, but sadly. He actually used the sentence, this is like a medical doctor telling a patient he's going to die out of cancer. That doesn't imply I'm in favor of cancer. Cancer. Is Joseph Schumpeter right? Well, I don't know, but I think everyone will agree with me that if we take a poll among the English, the English professors at any Ivy League, it's going to be extremely rare that you are going to find anyone who is even mildly in favor of markets. And finally, we have F.A. Hayek, which again, I have already mentioned several times, and he talked a lot about markets and the spontaneous orders that they created and thought very deeply about how markets deal with information. And we will come back to Hayek when we talk, for instance, about artificial intelligence. Let me use three more minutes, and then we stop for questions and answers to tell you a little bit about our teaching philosophy. So let me return to John Stuart Mill and his book on liberty, another book that absolutely everyone should read. And in chapter two, he writes this great line. He who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. His reasons may be good and no one may have been able to refute them, but he's equally unable to refute the reasons of the opposite side. If he does not so much as know what they are, he has no ground for preferring either opinion. John Stuart Mill is here saying something very deep. You may be right, but that's probably not something that should satisfy you. You may have good reasons to be right. You want to have good reasons to be right. Imagine that I'm absolutely right about what will happen with planetary motion tomorrow, but I just do it because I look at tea leaves. Will I find that an intellectually satisfactory answer? I don't think so. I think we can aspire to more. So John Stuart Mill says, look, even if you don't agree with position A, you really want to understand what position A is. And that links with an idea that I always tell my undergrads. And I'm going to call this an ideological Turing test. You probably have heard about the Turing test in computer science. So this was proposed by Alan Turing. And this is a steal from Blade Runner, the very classic movie. And some of you may remember this guy over here on white shirt is a replicant. And this person over here is an expert trying to figure it out if he's a replicant or a human being. The idea of the Turing test is, let's say five judges, five experts are going to uh, look at you and they are going to ask you questions, perhaps behind a screen, behind a, uh, so they don't really see you and they need to determine if you're a computer or a human being. And the idea of Turing was that computers will have a chief intelligence once they will be able to fool judges into thinking they were humans. The other way around is very easy. I mean, it's, it's nearly impossible for a human to fool someone into thinking uh, he's a computer because the only thing I need to do is ask you what is the square root of 1,300,032 million and you will not be able to do it at the top of your head. Now, Brian Kaplan, uh, an economist at George Mason has a nice variation of this idea, which by the way, uh, I will argue, I have heard about it before, but nonetheless, I don't think that Brian Kaplan really argues that uh, he was the inventor and he calls it an ideological Turing test. And his point is that you should only be really satisfied intellectually when a judge, imagine that, you know, there are pro-market views and anti-market views and a set of judges will inquire you and you will pretend to be, let's suppose that you are truly anti-market, but a set of um, judges will inquire you and you will not, and they will not be able to, you will pretend to be pro-market and they will not be able to tell that you are actually anti-market in real life or the other way around. And the reason I was saying this is actually an older idea is because back in my law school years, I had a much admired law professor, Juan Fernandez Armesto, and he told me once something that I remember to this day for moot court, which is this thing that you do in law school to prepare uh, yourself and to learn how to argue, always, always pick the side you think is in the wrong because that's what will teach you to be a really good lawyer. So our goal 
in this course is that by the end of it, you can pass the ideological Turing test and you can fake being a defender or a critic of markets and truly have good arguments for both sides of the debate and understand really what both sides of the debates are saying, not coming up with fake arguments. Just as a personal anecdote, and I finish here, I remember once talking with a colleague at my department and he was saying, oh, you are a believer in A. And I say, yes, oh, I have a great counter argument. And the yeah, counter argument was not very good. And I say, well, can you explain what A means? And you could tell he could not even articulate what A meant very well beyond being, you know, beyond like a very simple summary and a very childish summary. And when I explained to him what A was, I told him, look, you may or, this, may or may not agree with A, but that's what A is, what position A is. And he was very surprised because I don't think he really understood what A was before. But let me stop here just saying, you know, hopefully you will be happy at the end of the course because you have learned about the ideological Turing test and you are able to have good arguments in favor and against markets and being a better person out of that. So let me stop here and let me open the door for questions and answers. Thank you, Jesus. So the door for questions is open. If you have any, you can comment it right now. So one, one question we had is, Specifically to the definition of markets, how do we differentiate? Uh, how do we align our traditional concept of markets that highlights competition with the idea that markets are cooperative arrangements? Okay, so in my view, I think that the idea of markets involving competition confuses, I'm going to use an Aristotelian frame of mind, an accident with an essence. So let me put it in this way. I think that many markets are characterized by having competition. And in fact, those markets are going to be markets where in general, we expect good outcomes to come out of them because of the presence of competition. I still think that the interaction between three or four people where there is perhaps not a lot of competition and yet there is freely exchange, I will call that a market. And I find it very difficult not to call that type of institution a market. So imagine, I'm going to pick on Fernando right now. Imagine that, you know, Fernando and I are living in a, in a desert island. He lives to the north of the desert island. I live to the south of the desert island. It's only one on one. And yet he has coconuts and I have, um, I don't know, fish. And we are going to exchange. I think that the way I want to talk about the two of us exchanging fish for coconuts is a market. Now, it's a market where there's bilateral monopoly. So probably the type of arrangements that we may get may not be great, but I would like to call that interaction between Fernando and me a market. Great. Uh, a second question that I have more or less for understanding of what market exchanges are. How can we differentiate between gift giving and exchange? Is it something okay. inherent to the utility function of the agent? Yeah. So I think I will go back to Marcel Maus. Uh, view and mouse basically highlight whether or not there is an expectation of reciprocity. So if I go and I buy flowers to my mom, or when I did that, I never expected that my mom was going to say, oh, Jesus, I love you so much. I'm going to do your favorite dish for dinner. That was truly, I hope, a gift of love. However, when I go out with my friends, back when I was in college and I would say, oh, these rounds of beer, I pay for these rounds of beer. In some sense, that's a gift because I'm paying for everyone's drinks. But there was an expectation that someone else in the group will say, I will pay for the next round. And in, in fact, the social norm was that if you were the type of person who will never volunteer and say, I pay this round of beers, after a couple of weekends, you will not get invited any, any longer. So you can call that a gift? No, I will call that an exchange. So I think that the really at the, at the end of the day is whether or not there is an expectation of reciprocity, even if that reciprocity is intertemporal. And I give you the point that if we think uh, carefully, there may be a few cases where things are ambiguous, but I think this is a, a reasonable definition in practice. But I, I will say that 90% of the gifts we see in society is really exchanges, markets, where for whatever the reason, we don't want to call it a market. We find it a little bit cringy, or it's maybe just a way to get around, uh, you know, all the things that markets come associated with. 
in the lecture, you highlighted that in order for markets to operate, we needed a little bit degree of freedom. So how mm -hmm. can we understand markets that are defined by coercion, like really slavery or war, markets for war? How, how are we get to, understood, to understand that? Yeah, no, that that's that's a very good question. So I will I will I will I will frame it in a slightly different way. I would think I will I will say there is a very good argument to have an economics of slavery, where we build models about how two agents interact within an slavery relationship, and where there is coercion. So, for instance, Daron Atemoglu and Bolinsky have a very nice paper on that in Econometrica. I will be reluctant to call that a, a market because I don't think there is a market. Now, of course, you can argue that if there is a relationship between a, a slave person and a slaver, uh, for instance, in the South of the US before the Civil War, and then the product of that relationship is cotton and that cotton is sold on a market, there is an interrelationship between all these things that I don't deny whatsoever. But I think uh, it's just something now that I will not want to call a market. Do I think I want to write economic models about the slavery? Yes. Do I want to call that a market? No. And I think that calling it a market, the only thing is confuses two different institutions. And I think leads, as I was mentioning before, to misleading conclusions about how to read the economic evidence and more importantly, to misleading economic policy recommendations. Well, thank you, Professor Jesus. I think we've come reached to an end to the session. Um, remember everyone that we will continue this Thursday. We will have the, our first plenary lecture by Professor Michael Munger. He's a professor of economics, political science and public policy at Duke University. And he will kind of in introduce a little bit more on the topic of the importance of markets. So hopefully you will join us then and see you. Thank you. Thank you.